Welcome everybody. If you're not familiar with who we are, we are Defendify. We are the all-in-one cybersecurity platform. Um, I am Shanna Utgard. I'm the success manager here at Defendify, and I am joined by... Me, Jim Albright. I am in marketing over at Defendify, and I'm going to be helping Shanna today with this webinar. So I'm pretty excited. This will be fun. We got a couple of people still rolling in, but we're going to get started because we have a lot of fun topics and everything to uh, cover today. So if you're here, you probably either have experienced some phishing or you want to make sure that you're staying a little bit ahead of the curve. I can't imagine at this point that uh, people haven't been encountering phishing because it's one of the number one cyber threats that's out there. But if uh, you haven't yet, and this is kind of your intro and, and foray into spotting a fish welcome nice hey, all right. That one. all right yay okay um so before we get into to fishing we're gonna talk about really quickly who these bad actors are because these cyber threats come from a variety of different areas uh four big ones mostly in the top left we have cyber criminals that are causing their crimes to make money. In the top right, we have hacktivists who are causing their attacks because maybe they don't like a company or a political party. Anonymous is a great example. Uh, in the bottom left, we have cyber soldiers from other countries. They may even be state sponsored. They're going after the United States and um, you know, our public private government organizations. We're doing the same thing in the other direction in a defensive nature. Uh, one of our advisors here, Rob Kanaki, wrote a great book called The Fifth Domain, talking about that cyber warfare. We've been hearing about it a lot in the news lately. And then in the bottom right, we have our insider threats. So insider threats are employees, contractors, ex-employees, ex-contractors who have or had valid access to the network and data. Their actions could be malicious, but oftentimes they just do things in error. Um, you know, a great example is if I go to send an email with sensitive information to Jim, I start typing J-I-M, I hit enter, it auto-populates, but it sends it to the wrong Jim. Boom, I've just sent confidential information, been moving too quickly, and I've become an insider threat. Our, our insider threat here on this slide kind of looks like he's wearing like a, a COVID mask. I don't know if that's supposed to be a beard or just some kind of like attacker disguise, but kind of relevant for the times here. Yeah. <laughs> um, now that we know who those bad guys are, are, let's talk about the type of stuff that they are after. So the biggest thing that I hear is, well, we don't store credit card data, but all organizations have sensitive data beyond just credit cards. You could have personally identifiable information for your customers, for your employees, uh, your company information, company IP and trade secrets. What type of information do you have that you wouldn't want to get out there? Uh, we worked with a, a food company and they said nobody could get a hold of our recipes because if they did, they could make what we're making and then we don't have something unique. Uh, tax documents for your company, your employees. The beginning of the year, we always see a lot of W-2 stamps floating around. Bank information, wire transfer details. Um, that we were chatting before the webinar about the time that I wired $2.1 million to a cyber attacker. That was not a fun time. Uh, that was in a past life, by the way, not a Defendify. <laughs> your vendor agreements and price lists. There's even some sensitive information there if you've negotiated some discounts, legal documents, contracts, and all of your customer sensitive data. We mentioned that cyber criminals cause their crimes to make money. This gives you an idea of what data sells for in the dark web. If you're not familiar, the dark web is not a place that you go to with Google Chrome or Internet Explorer. You've got to use specific Tor browsers and people go there supposedly to hide their identity and there's chat rooms and forums and they're selling and exchanging things that they probably shouldn't be. Um, Social security numbers, you know, non-financial logins, about a dollar each. A financial login has a lot more value. Credit card information, people are usually surprised by that. It seems a little low, but it's mainly because our credit card companies do a great job of detecting that fraud while it's in action. Fulls info means that it comes with a, a lot more information beyond just the card number and CVV. Um, the more information that goes along with this, as you can see here, the more valuable it is. So medical records continue to top the charts. We see it over and over again because there's so much information in them. You know, the, the personally identifiable information, health information, social security numbers, insurance. So we've seen insurance fraud. We've also seen crazy things like extortion of a CEO of a company because they had an undisclosed medical condition. They didn't want everybody to know about it yet. Uh, and that was used against him from medical records. 
So now we know who the attackers are and what type of information they're after. There are a lot of different tactics that they use, but most of them contain a social engineering component. So that is you know, use of deception to manipulate people. Uh, it's kind of like people hacking, I like to call it. And the most prevalent of all of those is phishing. So we're, we're sending those emails, pretending to be somebody that we're not in an attempt to get you to reveal some type of information. Back in the day, this was kind of a shotgun approach that targeted large numbers of people at one time. You may have may remember the Nigerian prince who had millions of dollars to get out of the country. Believe it or not, we do still see this quite a bit, uh, but it was just a kind of a, a spray and pray approach. We just sent a lot of them out and hoped that somebody fell for it at some point. But today, these attacks are getting much more sophisticated. They use actual logos from companies. They look just like the real email templates that are being sent out. They're even able to spoof some email addresses. So it's not just as simple as looking for bad grammar or a weird domain of the sender anymore. They're getting really good. Uh, and they're also performing what is called spear phishing. So that's the act of sending emails to specific and well-researched targets uh, purporting to be a trusted sender. So the aim here is either to infect devices with malware or convince targets to hand over some information or some money. Um, and we won't go through every single different type of phishing because you start to get a, a little too granular for my preference. Um, whaling is another good example of a, a phishing attempt. That targets, like it sounds like, the big guys, uh, executive level employees. Um, typically, we see the whaling attacks using uh, account warnings, like some type of issue with your account, because they know if they can get the keys to the kingdom or any login credentials or anything else from you know, the, the man upstairs, not that one, but you know the big guy, uh, then they're going to get a lot of information out of the company. So there's a lot of reasons why these attacks are so successful, mainly because there is so much information available about us and our organizations online. So these attackers are resourceful. The first step in, in these uh, spear phishing attacks is an investigation. So they're researching. They're on your LinkedIn. They're on employee Facebook pages. They're taking a look around your company webpage. They're learning about the hierarchy and the relationships in your organization so that they can tailor emails to specific people based on their job responsibilities or something that they've learned about them. Uh, they're doing all of this research in order to make phishing emails look like uh, they're coming from somebody within the company. They may have found that information online and then you know they're they're going on LinkedIn and targeting people specifically based on those relationships and those roles. Um, another thing that they do in this research phase, I have a, a friend of mine who is a penetration tester, and he says he loves to watch LinkedIn because everybody gets really excited about their new job, which they should. So the first thing they do is they go in and they update LinkedIn. They tell people about their new position. Uh, they continue with their, their networking efforts. So new employees are particularly good targets because it's a new role they're eager to please and they're also unfamiliar with internal processes so my friend who's a penetration tester watches for these types of things so do the cyber attackers um, they're looking for those new position posts and updates um, sometimes they even will make a fake profile on social media connect with other people in the industry you know your friends your coworkers. this is a tactic called gatekeeper friending. Um, we've seen them craft different bogus connection invitation emails and, and victims logged into their real LinkedIn account, didn't even see the real request. Um, one of the things about social networking is that it's so simple to use that oftentimes people's guards are lowered and everything that you're posting online could potentially be used against you and your company. So if your marketing team, hi Jim, is doing a great job promoting your company, then there's even more information for these cyber criminals to utilize. So that information that you're sharing can be used against you. I've talked to several companies who have been victim of a scam that says, you know, hey, this is Jim, I'm at the CompTIA event. I, we, we're slammed in this booth right now. I need a giveaway. So can you go out and buy $1,500 worth of gift cards and scratch off the backs and email me the numbers. It's just so crazy busy in this booth right now. If, if you try to contact me, I probably will not be able to respond. 
So be conscious. It's not to say don't promote those things on, on social media, but just keep your guard up in that case because you shared that information online. It could be used against you. Jim, are you going to say something? Oh, I'm just looking at the chat and it's all yeses. Yeah, this a lot incredible. of yeses. I'll tell you, you know. Exactly. I, I, I think the uh, gift card thing is a, a very popular and then pretexting, which we're going to talk about. A lot of people have usually seen that as well. Uh, so just when you're out promoting events and things that you're at, make sure that your employees know to stay hyper vigilant during those times because that's information that could be used against you. Another thing here about social media sharing, while we're talking about that, I like to call it social media oversharing, we give away a lot of information on social media, and we also couple that with some pretty poor password habits, which is a topic for another time. But uh, we give away a lot of information that could hint at our possible passwords. Now, one of the things I want you to think about is now don't please do not put this one in the chat, uh, but think about your passwords that you use. Most of us use the same password across every single account. We recycle it. When we get real fancy, we might change the A to the at sign or, you know, go up a number or add an exclamation point. But I want you to ask yourself in your head, please not in the chat again, uh, if you include any of this type of information in your password, your pet's name, your children's name, your spouse's name, significant dates like your birthday or your birth year, your anniversary, your kids' birthdays, um, other family members' names, your hobbies, your vacation spots, your favorite sports teams, any of that type of information, we probably uh, could find on social media. Um, also, security questions. A lot of that information, people do these little surveys all the time on, on social media that are basically, if you think about it, asking types of questions that could be used for security answers. Um, I have completely made up answers. I have a whole like fake profile or maybe multiple personalities that's still yet to be decided. And all of my security questions are based on how my fake character would answer them so that nobody knows what those security questions are. My actual first dog's name or what I wanted to be when I grow up is not my security question. So really be careful about the type of information that you're sharing personally as well. Um, fun story. And I hope uh, that that the guy that I'm buying this from never watches this webinar, but um, I am buying a house right now. And uh, I was joking around with my broker and said that I bet I could guess the uh, door code on the, the, um, the door lock. And it was the guy's birthday, like month, day and year. And I said, I, I bet it's blah, 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 blah. And my broker was like, how did you know that? Like I looked the guy up on social media. And uh, I immediately went and asked him to change it. So if you're thinking of trying to pop over by my house, my new house I'm buying, you won't be able to. But people do that all the time. Their garage codes, their pins, all that type of stuff. So just think about that outside of even just your work context. All right. Another thing about social media sharing, out of office messages. This is kind of a, a, a sensitive topic. Um, I'm not a big fan of out of office emails. That is a prime for uh, the cyber attackers. So let's say, you know, my out of office message says that, you know, Cheryl's out of office, please contact Joe for any assistance. An attacker could do some social media research. Cheryl, you know, posts on Facebook that she's traveling to Tahiti. Woo, go Cheryl. Um, so the attackers might craft an email that looks like it's coming from Cheryl saying, you know, oh, I'm, I'm in Tahiti. I'm unable to be reached. I don't get cell phone reception down here, but I need you to send this wire, buy these gift cards, fill in the blank. Or they could create an email to Joe saying, oh, Cheryl told me that while she was in Tahiti, um, she asked me to have you buy these gift cards and this wire or whatever it might be. So you're sharing a lot of information about who your supervisor is, where you are, and that can be used. Uh, I won't go too far down this rabbit hole, but attackers have also even been using the built-in Microsoft automatic replies and out of office systems to perpetrate attacks because Microsoft is not going to spam filter itself and its own emails that it's sending. So it's just another example of how incredibly creative these attackers are getting. So um, I personally am not a big fan of those out of office messages. 
Now pretexting, make sure you still have that chat up. How many of you have ever seen one of these go out to your employees? Hi, how are you doing? I need you to go shopping for me right now. Or I need you to send me your personal cell phone number. It's a pretty popular one. This is an example of pretexting. It's another form of social engineering where the attackers are focusing on creating a good pretext or a fabricated scenario that they're going to use to try to get more information out of their victims. So usually they'll say that they need little bits of information from their target, uh, or they'll try to confirm identity or get cell phone, uh, and then they'll use that to stage some secondary attacks. So yes, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of yeses here, and I'm also going to throw out there even chatbots, right? So think about this. They can go into a company's chatbot and start asking questions about other people within the organization to try to get some information. We happen to see that quite frequently recently, I think. Yeah, chatbots are a, a big attack method right now. So if you have one of those on your website, that's where it really comes in for some of that employee training. Uh, if you have, obviously, people are going to be answering the phone at your organization, it's really important to provide some training for the people that are responding to those inbound chat requests or answering the phone about giving out uh, information, whether it's, you know, executives, phone numbers, or email addresses, or even little details about them. It, what might seem like an, an innocuous question could be used as a piece of information that they're gathering to stage those secondary attacks. I know we're talking today about phishing, but vishing is the same thing. It's just conducted by phone, and it targets those assistants, receptionists, a lot of times like your finance team members. Uh, they might pose as like your, your internal or outsourced help desk support uh, or you know tech support uh, could be pretending to be a, a bank a vendor a customer uh, a lot of the times they'll call towards the end of the day they'll act really angry and frustrated and like they're in a hurry and the employee just wants to go home and make dinner and deal with screaming kids all night and they just want to you know answer the request and be able to clock out for the day so you know they might look up your company figure out who your it person is call up and pretend to be like oh hey this is john from it as i found that information on linkedin i need to blah 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 alphabet soup some it tech thing that you probably wouldn't understand anyway so i'm going to send you a link or i need you to go to this website or what's your password so that i can fix this problem uh, and a lot of employees, especially if they use the right name or spoof a phone number, will give that type of information up. So um, having clear, defined processes and setting those expectations with the employees is very important. Jason had a quick question here before we move on. Curious as to an alternative to your out of office. Um, what, if I go on vacation, I just have my emails forwarded directly to whoever needs to see them. Um, so just going in and, and setting up some email forwarding, also double checking while you're in there that no other rules have been set up, but um, you know, that way your, your emails are still being answered by whoever would have been listed in your out of office, but um, you know, instead of replying and letting somebody know that you're out of office, that way you can filter out you know, any of those other emails or attackers aren't getting that information. All right, that was a great question, Jason. So back to the spear phishing, once they've done all of that research and gathered all of the information that they need to target a perfectly executed spear fish, uh, they're going to send that email off usually. Um, even with the most expensive and comprehensive enterprise level spam filters, these types of emails still get through. Uh, they're continuously going through and, and looking at the way the systems work and uh, bypassing you know, whatever changes or updates Microsoft or Google have made to the spam filter or even you know, the, the external spam filters. So when these emails land on the employee's inbox, the uh, cyber criminals are trying to get you to do one of four things typically. They want you to go to a website or fill out a form trying to get some type of information. Most commonly is going to be uh, login credentials, usernames and passwords. They want you to click on a link, you know, which oftentimes is going to take you to a malicious website, again, usually with a form uh, trying to get credentials or other information. They want you to open a file. A lot of these phishing emails have attachments, Word, Excel, PDF, all popular attack methods, or they're trying to get you to take some type of action. So perhaps send some, a sensitive document, pay an invoice, initiate a wire transfer, send some confidential information, buy gift cards, uh, those types of things. So those are the four actions. Fill out a form, click on a link, open a file, or take some type of action that we're going to be on the lookout for.
if you came to this webinar looking for tips such as make sure that you scan the sender's domain, look at what time it was sent, look for bad spelling or grammar, check the URLs, this isn't going to be that kind of webinar, and I'll tell you why. You can go through all of those types of things if somebody's actual email account is taken over. Um, you know, you can look at the sender's domain all you want. It could be somebody that you've done business with over and over and over again. Maybe they're sending you an invoice on the same day that you know you, you normally would receive it. All of those types of things can be compromised. Your actual email account can be taken over. It can pass every single one of those, scan this email and check this, and it still could be a malicious file, a malicious attachment, send you to a, a malicious website. So um, I always like to look at this like, you know how people are, are usually split? Um, throw this in the chat because we're going to really start to get really interactive right now. Uh, what do you prefer, baking or cooking? So baking or cooking. Now, most of you, if you say cooking, your answer is probably because you like to just take a whole bunch of ingredients, throw it into a pot, totally wing it, ordering. I like you, Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> Uber right Eats. Where are you? Right, exactly. For the win. Um, if you like to cook generally, you know, you don't like the people always say, oh, baking is such an exact science, right? You guys probably heard that before. Um, kind of yes and no my grandmother was a baker and she had a, a bakery down here in Agunquit, Maine for years and if you really learn how the ingredients work when you heat them up in the oven you can bake by the seat of your pants too so uh i want you to think of this kind of like um you know the we want to be a, like we don't want this to be an exact science of, of looking at all of the you know the specific recipe and exactly how to follow it we want to be able to know how everything works so we can just throw a bunch of stuff in the pot and have it come out somewhat delicious oh pam thanksgiving yum now i want to make a turkey or at least have like a turkey sandwich or something all right so the first thing that we are going to look for in these phishing emails is an emotional response. So if that email is causing any type of emotional response with you, that should be the immediate sign to pump the brakes. Uh, usually these requests are just shrouded in fear, urgency, doubt. So these are the types of things that we are going to be looking for in all of the examples we're gonna ping through. And these are real live actual emails that we've seen out in the wild. So here's what we're looking for. We're looking for the fear emotion. So is it some type of you know unauthorized login, a cancellation notice, like some something that is causing you to go <gasps> greed. So there's a lot of uh, money mule schemes, or I saw an attachment one time that said like company payroll, there was even a, a USB stick that was dropped in a parking lot as part of a social engineering experiment that said payroll on it. Oh, that one got plugged in a lot. It's a great thing. You want to see how much people also curiosity, um, see how much other people make or, you know, make some extra money, whatever it might be curiosity so that payroll one's a good example like oh curious um you know is something that that makes you go huh what's this helpfulness so um you know fulfilling some type of request uh we see this a lot with like you know the phone type of scams and new employees um also there's a, a outside of work i'll give you some examples today that will help you outside of work as well but you know you get a call that says that your friend is stuck in another country and they need some money it's a, another helpfulness play uh urgency so anything with like you know deadlines time limits somebody is unable to be contacted during that time um you know we're gonna shut off your account ban you from whatever the system is and then reward or penalty. So it could be something, you know, great. And I'll give you some examples of those. Or it could be a penalty. You have to do something to avoid the bad thing happening. So these are what we're looking for. Fear, greed, curiosity, helpfulness, urgency, reward, and penalty. So get those chat boxes up. We're going to start cranking through some of these examples. Because instead of just, you know, catching some fish, we're going to learn to fish here. Pun intended. Uh, and another thing here, this is what these attackers are after. So this is piece number two to keep in mind. They're trying to get your credentials, your logins, your usernames and passwords. They're trying to get information about your financials or your identity, your intellectual property, maybe yours or a client's or somebody that you work with, you know, bigger, larger enterprise organizations or they're just trying to flat out extort you for money. Um, we worked with a, a company here in Maine who the guy said on the call, we blow holes in the earth. 
and they had a ransomware incident that kept that, their network down for a month. And he said, I didn't think we had any type of information. We're literally just like hardworking mainers that just blow things up. And I said, you have money. If you have $10 and the cyber attacker can extort you for eight, they're going to. So logins, financial or identity information, intellectual property or money. So here's a first example of a fish. So this is um, what's an example of an account verification or a type of email to correct an issue. So um, like an issue with payment or we need, in this case, need you to add a recovery phone number, uh, account lockouts, unauthorized logins. So in your chat box, let's have that up here. Um, we want, I wanna know which emotion this plays off of. Is it fear? Greed, curiosity, helpfulness, urgency, reward, penalty. Could be more than one. Just throw what you think down in that. Fear, greed, curiosity, helpfulness, urgency, reward, penalty. Yes, definitely fear. I think it's a little urgency too there, Shanna. Yep, urgency. So if you don't do this, your account will be deactivated shortly. All your email data will be lost permanently. So we've got a penalty in there as well. So we got fear, urgency, penalty. Great job, everybody. Next one. Here's an example of 31 emails quarantined from me at bancochilecl.com to me. What do you know? Um, so I had 31 quarantined message in my spam portal. This is due to a system error. Quarantine emails will be deleted three hours. Use the button below to review, I think maybe, and receive your emails. Look, even our website. All right, so what do we got here? Fear, greed, curiosity, helpfulness, urgency, reward, and penalty. Fear, urgency. Got a clock on it. You bet. Exactly. Curiosity, too. Great job, John. Yes, curiosity, because what are those 31 quarantine messages? I want to know what they are. So click the button below to review my emails. Absolutely perfect. You guys knocked that one out of the park. All right, here's another one. So another attack method and common uh, template that we see in these phishing attacks are anything pertaining to payment information, invoices, receipts. These are usually either attachments that are um, you know, on the email or a link to go view like a Google Doc, which is a, a huge attack method right now. So fear, greed, curiosity, helpfulness, urgency, reward, or penalty. View sheet. Uh, I actually got an email a couple months ago from somebody who I had done a lot of business with and we had exchanged quite a few documents and um, you know he'd sent me a lot of different things and I about three days before we had been on a call together this was somebody from a, another security vendor that we, we we work with a lot and he sent me a, a you know document link and I what you should do in this situation, we'll talk about this a little bit more, is always, always pick up the phone and call. And I had had quite a few documents over the last few days that had been exchanged with him. And I picked up the phone and I called him and I said, hey, did you just send me another document? And he said, no. And then I went back and looked at the email again. And in, in the fake signature block, it looked good. But in the actual like email subject line, you know, so-and-so has sent you a document. Uh, his name was actually spelled wrong. And I was like, oh, but he's got a really unique kind of difficult name like me. So um, I was very glad. We always want to confirm, even if it's an invoice that I receive on the 15th of the month, every single month, pick up the phone and call. Just make sure. Yes, Bill, the, this will be available as a link later. Please forward this to your team. Teach everybody. So thank you. Um, so this one, a lot of different things going on here. Um, we've got some curiosity, uh, reward, because, you know, a payment report. So we want to know what that is. Uh, greed, maybe even. You guys starting to see the trend here with the emotional responses. All right, new voicemail message. We see these a lot. Voicemails, 
as well as scans and faxes, kind of those automated services that we have now. A lot of our voicemail systems will give us the, the transcription, the, autom the you know, recording link. Um, same thing with scans and faxes. I don't know very many companies who still have like an actual fax machine. Uh, a lot of them are all digitized. Scans are coming in digitally. So this is a, a favorite attack method from the uh, bad actors. So fear, greed, curiosity, helpfulness, urgency, reward, and penalty. All about curiosity. Who yeah. is calling me right now? Curiosity, urgency. We always want to make sure that we get back to people as soon as possible. Um, you know, depending on uh, what our, our job is, it could be a reward. It could be like, you know, if you're in a sales role, it could be like a new you know, customer. It could be a, a penalty if maybe you're in customer service or some type of complaint receiving role or so a lot of different emotions going on there. Let's take a look at another one. Uh, teleconferencing. So, I mean, digital transformation over the last year. Am I right? Um, a lot of people are using some type of teleconferencing software. So uh, this was an actual email, as you can see, that I received. Uh, click this URL and also see that nice generic greeting. Hi there. Please click this URL to start your Zoom meeting as your participant, Sophia Johnston, is waiting. I don't know a Sophia Johnston, but still, um, this is a, um, and you can see I actually got this last week. <laughs> um, a very common attack method here. If you actually go in and uh, look at this link, it's not actually a, a Zoom link. Uh, but these are, and you see the email address here, zoom.outlookmailer.com. Um, so what, what's this one? Fear, greed, curiosity, helpfulness, urgency, reward, penalty? Don't let Sophia wait. Exactly. Urgency. Curiosity, who Sophia? Have you guys ever been a uh, Zoom bombed? So you know this could potentially be a Zoom bomb. I don't know who Sophia is. Is this a Zoom bomb? Also, curiosity, want to see uh, who that person is? Um, could be helpfulness, absolutely. You know you don't want to keep people waiting, so you want to jump in. You want to be helpful and, and get them to where they need to be or answer some questions. Beautiful. Uh, here's another great one. Uh, this one also came to me. So, hey, it's odd, but I've received a certain amount of strange news about you. How are you going to give details about this? A little Google Drive folder to avoid distribution. Ooh, thinly veiled threat. I have protected the information. This is your personal password. It's very serious. Give it some thought. Don't do this anymore. Fear, greed, curiosity, Whoa. helpfulness, urgency, reward, penalty. Pretty strong language in here. Right? And I like how it's kind of like, I don't nap. Even <laughs> want even to speak with you after this. Exactly. Yes, yeah, helpfulness penalty. This is uh, this is definitely a curiosity one. We see these types of things all the time. Is this a picture of you on social media? And people click on it all the time. You know, there were the joke ones that went around for a while. Like, I can't believe this person did this, and then it took you to your own social media page. And especially because that one was a previous, you know, joke. A lot of people, when they get those like, oh my gosh, is this you? They think it's going to be one of those types of, you know, little like joke social media things that, that are going around the, the modern day, like chain email. Uh, but it's not, it's actually a cyber attack. So that curiosity, um, you know, some little bit of like penalty in here because I'm trying to avoid distribution. All right. And then another thing here, going back to that social media research that these attackers are doing. So they are really looking at who holds what role within your organization, and they are targeting people based on their role within the company. So for example, if my job at Defendify is a recruiter, then for me to do my job, I have to open resumes and I have to review candidates. Uh, if my job is in accounts payable, then I have to review invoices and I have to make sure that they get paid. So they're targeting people specifically based on that job that's listed on LinkedIn. So example, like my name is Fiona, I'm interested in a job, I've attached a copy of my resume, I look forward to hearing back from you. Um, this is a very common attack method specifically targeted for those um, 
you know, recruiters and people in HR that have to, um, you know, that's part of their, their job responsibilities. Stephanie said she just got one of these last week. Stephanie, what's your, what's your role at your organization? Are you in HR or did they specifically IT assistant? Yeah. So they know that you're probably the person that's going to be screening things before anybody else. So they, they probably targeted you. Did anybody else get one or, or just you? Oh, yeah, exactly. Just her. So they're they're doing their research. They're smart. They're taking the time. It's not just that Nigerian prince anymore. So um, they're they're very particular in who they're sending these to. Um, so fear, greed, curiosity, helpfulness, urgency, reward, penalty. You can throw those in there. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend. I mean, there are definitely we could go down a rabbit hole of different technology solutions that you could use to, you know, sandbox some of these attachments and be able to view them without, you know, making a, a big old mess or utilizing one of those types of platforms where they have to submit any applications through, um, you know, that that website or that third party service so that, you know, you're getting a little bit of extra protection. Uh, I actually when I applied for my job at Defendify, I sent Rob my little cheeky cover letter and my resume and I didn't hear back. And then I was like, oh, goodness, of course, you're not going to just open an attachment from a stranger. So then I went in and applied online and then I got a response back. So uh, make sure that you're directing people to respond through one of those portals or one of those other ways and not answering those emails that come in directly to your organization. All right, so it goes even further than computers. Text messaging is also an attack method. Every single one of these text messages that you see here is an example that I have received to my own personal cell phone. So I got FedEx delivery confirmations, a lot of these types of you know delivery notifications. Your package is unable to be delivered. Um, Due to the pandemic, Netflix is giving everyone a free one-year subscription to help you stay at home. Look at that reward. So, you know, curiosity, we got to, you know, get yours here. So, yeah, Pam says she gets them a lot. You know what my favorite one now is? Your phone's been getting too many spam messages. Click here to make it stop. <laughs> they're good. They're, they're pivoting all the time. You know, your uh, visa card blocked message call this number and some random code. Um, I mean, who doesn't have a visa card nowadays? So they target these, you know, you'll get emails from like, you know, your most recent Walmart receipt was selected for something, something, click this link. Who doesn't? shop at Walmart, who doesn't have like, you know, Netflix or a Visa card or uh, I, you can look up based on people's cell phone numbers, who their cell phone provider and carrier is. Um, so, you know, you have one message from AT&T. Well, of course, I have AT&T. You can look that up based on, you know, my, my phone number, first couple digits. Um, people get packages all the time. You can see my, my text message on that one I received on December 27th. So that was right around Christmas when all those packages were being sent out like oh i'm getting a package around christmas it must be a late order because everyone was doing online shopping in the poor post office so these are all real life examples um they'll call and say these types of things um i got a call from at&t a couple weeks ago that said there was an outage in my area and that they wanted to give me a credit on my bill but weird they didn't have my account information there they wanted me to confirm it to make sure that i got my credit um if you get a phone call from somebody, hang up and call your bank or um, you know your credit card company or your phone provider, whoever they're claiming to be. Tell them, you know, I I thank you for the information. I'm going to hang up and call AT and T back on a known and verified number that I have for them. If that person on the phone starts giving you any kind of pushback whatsoever, they're a cyber attacker. Hang up on them and call AT and T. Well, you don't really probably need to anyway, but uh, if you get a message saying FedEx is going to be delivering your order again, uh, go directly to the FedEx website or also let it be a surprise. Have fun with it. It's a package. You don't need to track it. It'll get there when it gets there. Um, you know, Netflix, things that sound too good to be true probably are. If they say your Visa card is blocked, call your credit card company directly. You don't want to click on these links. You don't want to respond. Uh, anything that is a promotion will likely be available like on their website. You do not want to click on these links. And we'll talk about what's going to happen there. Um, the reason why 
smishing, which is SMS phishing, is really popular nowadays is because many employees are able to access sensitive company information on their personal mobile phones. So that's why you're getting targeted with those text and SMS. Also, some of these are just you know, to get your personal or financial information. Um, think about the open rates of text messages, right? Emails, I, I might open 30% uh, of my emails. Text messages, we open every single one of them. There's no spam filters in place for our text messages. And look at all these little links. They're all shortened and you know, we don't see like what the full link is. We can't really look and scan it and see where it's actually going. So this is a massive, massive uh, attack method here, getting you to click on those links and gaining access to that mobile phone because then maybe they could get into your company email um, or anything else, trigger some password resets for your QuickBooks or you know, your, your other accounts that are more valuable to them. So if an unexpected email phone call or text, asks you to fill in a form, click on a link, open a file or an attachment, do an action, or reply with some confidential information. Uh, delete it. If it's important, reach out to the sender to ver on a different method. Don't just reply to the email or text message or, or phone call because you're probably just talking back to the attacker. Um, so reach out on a different method and confirm and verify that that was a document that was sent to you or it was an actual legitimate request. So why? What are they looking to do or accomplish here? Often the goal of these phishing emails is one of these types of end results. Uh, business email compromise where they actually take over your account, your email account, uh, delivering malware in attachments, ransomware or credential harvesting. So here's a, some examples. Um, in these attachments, a lot of the time they're asking you to enable content or enable macros. Sometimes these attacks uh, will even give you um, step-by-step instructions on how to go in and enable that content. The malicious macros in, in the emails and the attachments is an increasingly common way of delivering malware. It could be a, a keylogger, it could be a ransomware infection, um, they could you know, leave a, a backdoor to be able to access your computer or your systems. And a lot of the times these documents get past antivirus programs with no problem because uh, those all the, that malicious code and attachments are in that document and the macros have been disabled. So if you don't enable them, that attack is unsuccessful. So they give you nice step-by-step -step instructions on how to help them out. Once you open that attachment and you click that enable content button, that's when the malware starts functioning. And it's gonna, you know, could allow remote control of your device or, uh, you know, keep track of every keystroke that you make. Another thing they're trying to do is credential harvesting. So um, if you get one of those phishing emails, you click on the link, it's going to take you to a website that, you know, looks like a Microsoft sign in, but it's not. When you type in your email and your password, they're getting everything that you type on the other end. Um, so they're trying to harvest your usernames and your passwords. Here's a great example of some actual like real life outside of work phishing emails. We've got one from Netflix because again, especially the last year who doesn't have Netflix, right? So kind of a little bit of the Nigerian Prince widespread approach um, saying, get back to your account to or update your account to get back to watching Netflix. They take the logos. They even sign the email your friends at Netflix, just like our friends at Netflix do. Here's an example of a reset your password email. So either you need to update or somehow you're gonna lose access to all of those shows. How are we gonna know what's going on in the circle? And then it will take you to a page that looks like Netflix. It even has a, you know, kind of a decent looking domain here, you know, login.netflix-activate.com. And then it's going to ask you to update whatever that information is. Everything that you're typing in here is just going right back to that cyber attacker. So whether it's your credit card number or your username and your password, they're trying to uh, harvest your credentials or your personal information. I love this one, security question, mother's maiden name, just for good measure, why not? Uh, they can also manipulate links. So in this first one here, we'll do in the, can you spot the difference? Legitimatedomain.com, legitimatedomain.com. Anybody got an idea of what the difference is between those two links? And yes, they are different. Well, While you're at it, if you want to, if you think you know the answer to the what's wrong here as well, you can take a look at that one. The what's wrong here, 
it took me a little while to get that one. I, I did find it eventually, but I was like, I don't really know what's wrong here. It is a uppercase I. So uppercase I and a lowercase L, we see this with some zeros and O's. Um, we see domains that have RN back to back instead of an M. So there are ways to manipulate those links. And the what's wrong here, Instagram.com slash verification. Todd says, I'm not sure what the character is called. Which, which character? Oh yeah, I, I see what you're talking about. Yes, Duncan, the A in gram, that is an alpha symbol. So you see the first Instagram A and then the second Instagram A? Yes. So a lot of people just looking at that really quickly wouldn't notice the difference. So crazy. And then I hate to break it to you, but it gets worse. So there are domains that are actually allowed to be created in international characters. So this is a proof of concept from a, um, a cyber researcher. And basically what he did is changed all the characters here. Like the A in ASCII is different from the Cyrillic A. So typically browsers, they won't let you have kind of a mixture there of different languages. But if you put all of the characters replaced with a similar from the same language, um, the browsers bypassed all of those defense mechanisms that, that, that they have in place. So this looks like it's going to HTTPS. We've got the secure lock screen and everything. So of course it must be secure. Apple.com that's really in a kind of a different language and it is taking them right to something that looks like Apple.com. So this is a, a really, really sophisticated attack. And, and this, you know, attacker did put like, hey there, this is just a, a proof of concept here that this is a, a security flaw. But um, it could have been a page that ripped off the Apple and looked exactly like, you know, their account and had some type of promotion or special or log into your, you know, your, your Apple ID account or anything. So um, the best practice here, anybody want to throw that in the chat, what you should do if you see some, you know, oh, click on this apple.com, copy and paste it in a different font, just open a new browser tab and go directly to the page that you are looking at. So if it's a FedEx notification or an Apple type notification, just navigate directly to that website, bypass that link completely because it could be fake. Uh, and the reason why they're after all of our credentials is because most accounts are guarded by duplicated passwords. So the attackers can either have you type in your password on a credential uh, grabbing form or find that information available on the dark web because they know that if you use Shanna at company.com and Sunshine123 as your password for Dropbox that was breached, then chances are it's probably also what you use for your email and your QuickBooks and every other important system, your banking, all of that. So um, password recycling is a topic for another time, but uh, this is why that information is so valuable to them. They might not care about your MySpace account, but you might still be using that password for your banking. Uh, they're also trying to deliver ransomware, so they want to, you know, lock up all of your systems and demand payment in Bitcoin to get your information back. So that's another one of their goals in all of these phishing emails. And then it's fascinating to watch the way that everything changed in the phishing attacks through the pandemic. I don't want to harp too much on this, but it was really interesting to see how they took advantage of us. We've been talking about these psychological factors, these emotional responses and the phishing side of things. So the attacks started off in the beginning with safety measures, symptoms, things like that. You got to figure, um, I don't know where you guys are all located, but a lot of companies that we talk to and work with are located in the United States. Throw something down there in the chat about about where you are, if you're in Canada or even somewhere across one of the big ponds, or if you're here in the US, um, they had, by the time the pandemic really got full force over to us, it had been through Asia, Europe, they had a lot of time to really perfect their scams and their approaches. So the first wave of attacks were about safety measures and symptoms. Um, we talked about attackers directing you to a spoofed or uh, a web page that looks like, you know, what, what you might 
expect. So from March 14th to 18th, which was probably, depending on where you're located, about the time that we were all frantically scrambling to work from our living rooms, there were 3,600 new domains that were registered with some form of coronavirus or COVID. Almost 4,000 new websites popped up over four days that all of these phishing emails were being pointed back to. From the safety measures and symptoms and that kind of first wave of, of emotional response, we moved into that fear and curiosity of new cases confirmed in your area. Click here for details. Like find out. So, you know, you've got all of that fear, uh, urgency, curiosity. Then the attacks moved into disaster relief. Businesses started struggling. You know, all these organizations came out with some assistance and aid. So the attackers started, you know, launching these disaster relief grant and loan scams. So they really know how to take advantage of all of the heightened emotions, you know, what people need, they pay attention to what's going on. Recently, they've been capitalizing on supply chain shortages. So we've seen examples like actual cyber attacks on businesses that, you know, are creating PPE or, you know, something to do with the pandemic and they're getting, you know, malicious attacks that are quotes or asking for price information or, you know, offering alternative suppliers or, um, you know, a lot of purchase order. Good example here. So we're seeing a lot of the capitalization on those supply chain shortages in the, the phishing. And we're seeing text message scams in contact tracing. So someone who you came in contact with has tested positive or shown symptoms, like find out more, click here. Um, we see other things like updates, you know, when companies put out information on their newsfeed, like on remote work changes or anything that they put publicly, those fake Zoom invites that, that we showed earlier. So they really target exactly what's going on in the world and the emotions that are associated with it. So again, if an unexpected email asks you to fill in a form, click on a link, open a file or an attachment or perform an action, verify, trust, but verify. And then in developing a cybersecurity program for your organization, please share this recording if you want them to learn a little bit about phishing, if you want to share this with your teammates or even bring the link home, share it with your friends and family members, anybody that you want. Um, we always encourage you to think about cybersecurity as a, uh, not as a project, it's an ongoing posture that everyone in the organization needs to take. And we also really harp on employing a defense in depth strategy so that, you know, all these, I like the little virus look here, um, each layer of security, nothing is perfect. If anybody tells you that a, a security solution is going to stop all attacks, um, either they're flat out lying to you or they just don't understand how security works. So every piece of, of our defense strategy has some holes. It has some weaknesses, kind of like some Swiss cheese. But if we layer enough of those pieces of Swiss cheese on top of each other, you know, eventually we're going to have less and less holes that any of those attackers or viruses or malware are going to be able to get through through, you know, and, and get all the way down to the end. Is it possible that, you know, all the holes line up and they're able to get all the way down to the end and, and access our systems? Absolutely, always possible. Um, but the more pieces of cheese we have in place, the better protected we're going to be. And you need multiple layers. So we believe in a layer of technology beyond traditional antivirus and firewall, a culture of employee awareness because your, your cyber defenders are either a strength or a weakness, and then a strong foundation of policies, procedures, and plans. So when it comes to rolling out a cybersecurity awareness program, we really recommend starting off with a cybersecurity assessment. No doctor is just going to start ordering you know, medication and, and procedures without doing some testing and, and some diagnostics first and determining what the problems are before they just jump right into treating them. So, um, you know, do a full risk assessment, find out where you stand. And then on the employee side of things and building a security program, you want to make sure that you have a couple elements in place, a clear technology and data use policy. Everybody likes to know what the rules are. You know, we Inherently, most of us want to follow the rules. We want to have clear expectations and we want to have those expectations across all employees. So have clearly defined policies that everybody signs off on on how to use technology. 
and also have a written uh, incident response plan so that um, your employees have confidence that you have those precautions in place for you know the inevitable breach that is going to happen. Um, I always like to tell people to operate under that assumed breach mentality, um, but provide them a process for identifying that an incident is occurring. Build that confidence up. Give them a way to report suspected breaches and encourage them to report these types of things. You don't want employees that go, oh crap, I think I just did the thing, but I'm not really sure and I don't want to tell anybody, anybody about it. So I'm just going to uh, just pretend that that didn't happen and just close out the window and everything's fine. We see this all the time in our phishing simulations. People will like click on the link, they get the little oops screen and then they just close it out like, I didn't do that. And then they never say anything about it. So you want to encourage that, create a culture where employees are, you know, reporting these types of incidents so that you can investigate them. It might be something that needs, you know, some further remediation. It might be nothing, but at least they're reporting them as they come up. And then bring everybody together. I mean, a lot of companies do once a year awareness training where there's a video in the Defendify in the platform that checks the box from an annual cybersecurity training perspective. You know, a lot of people need that for compliance requirements. But to me, that's if somebody tells me I got to build a fence, I can build it out of bacon. Is it going to keep anybody out of whatever I put that fence around? Probably not, but I checked the box for compliance. I built the fence. Uh, so annual training is great. We've got a video that takes employees through just basics, um, phishing, malware, ransomware, two-factor authentication, password health, things like that. But you really want to follow it up with ongoing micro learning videos that are up to date about current scams and threats. Um, these benefits, all, these provide a lot of benefit outside of work as well. A woman the other day told me that she plays the awareness videos for her husband and son every month when they come out because you know it helps her keep her loved ones safe. Uh, and there's always some information that you can learn from those little micro learning videos, you know, and set the expectation with the employees about the security program. You know, they got a whole month to watch a three minute video, not too difficult. And then just like if you were learning to you know, play baseball or some type of sport, just going to an annual summer camp to learn some of the basics and fundamentals isn't going to be enough to really develop your skills. So we encourage you to put fishing simulations in place. Um, this is your batting practice. This is not a gotcha game. This is meant to keep your employees hyper vigilant build up their muscle memory and recognizing the attacks when they're coming in, um, you know, being able to either report them to your IT team or just delete them, whatever your process is, and just, you know, keep them, keep them always on high alert. So launching the fake emails, if the employees click on the links or open the attachments, they'll get, you know, quick spot training. This will really help you to quantify the effectiveness of your awareness training over time. So with some custom reporting, you can see that nice reduction reduction in the number of interactions with the employees. You can identify any weak areas and provide additional training and support for your high risk employees, or as I like to call them, the clicking time bombs. And also, failure is okay. You can encourage employees, like if they click on a phishing simulation, this is a real Defendify phishing simulation that Defendify sent to all of us. It was a Christmas party survey. I failed. I am totally gung-ho about telling people that I have failed a phishing simulation and I eat, sleep, and breathe this all day long. So encourage your employees to reflect on the circumstances when they failed. Was it Monday morning, were they under caffeinated, under a deadline, were the kids screaming in the background? Was it a you know short holiday week preceding a vacation and you were totally checked out in vacation mode? I'm not saying that was me, but it was me. Um, you know, what happened? What was the emotion in that email that got them? Was it, you know, curiosity, fear, penalty, reward, urgency, greed? What was it that tripped them up? So encourage them to reflect on those circumstances. And then um, for yourself, stay up to date on, you know, the continuing education, cyber threats evolve like crazy. So um, stay up to date on patches, updates, security vulnerabilities, um, get those ongoing notifications and, and threat alerts of what's happening out there in the landscape because it just, it changes. And then, you know, to the right of Boom, make sure that you're doing some ongoing credential monitoring because uh, especially in a, a digital world and, um, you know, the 
switch to remote work, we're using so many more cloud applications. So that username and password and hopefully multi-factor authentication, those are the keys. So if somebody gets a hold of those keys, you want to know about it right away so that you can have the employees go in and change their usernames and passwords if any of those credentials are compromised. So we want to have a an oops and a plan in place for if those credentials do get out, we're not we might cry a little bit over the spilled milk, but we don't need to throw away the whole cow. And all those types of elements of your cybersecurity program need to be all on and all you know, turning and working together at the same time. Um, we do have a, an amazing platform that helps to consolidate and automate all of those tools and different sec, uh, separate components of a cybersecurity program. This is not a total Defendify sales pitch, um, but if you're interested in learning more or automating your cybersecurity program, we are more than happy to help you. We are going to take some questions if you have any, but I also want to mention that we have three free tools. These are no obligation. Uh, we don't ever, we're not going to ask you for a credit card. They don't expire. These are just for you to get out ahead of these cyber threats. We know how crazy they all are and how quickly they evolve. So our three free cybersecurity tools get you set up with a Defendify platform. You can run a cybersecurity health checkup, see where you stand, get a grade. If you're under any compliance requirements, we map to several different frameworks so we can help you out with some HIPAA. Uh, if you're in manufacturing, the, the NIST 800-171 interim rule, CMMC, all that acronym stuff. <laughs> Uh, we'll map to that. We'll show you where you, you stand there um, or just some general cybersecurity. External network vulnerability scanning. If you've go, gone back and forth, remote work, back in the office, remote work, back in the office over the last year, we will scan your external network for free. Just make sure that you know there aren't any holes or exposures there. Every single month, we'll run a new report for you. Again, no obligation, no payment, no nothing. And then threat alerts, you know, staying up to date on how that industry changes and, you know, all those notifications and all the crazy stuff out there, like Equifax breach uh, or the, the API issue that we saw, which will be a new threat alert. So if you want to sign up for that, the website down there is defendify.io slash essentials. And uh, StrongBad may not know anything about phishing, but now we all do. So thank you for spending some time learning about some phishing scams, how to stay safe. And please feel free to circulate this with your team members and have everybody else because everybody needs to be a nice, strong cyber defender. And the more we are aware, the more we can stop these bad guys. I mean, these things are tricky. It is so hard to be that diligent. And like you said, just like going out to a sports team, you've got to learn every single day about what new threats have evolved and, and what could potentially impact your business. You know, there's been a 300% increase in cyber incidents reported to the FBI since COVID hit alone. So those examples you showed are just obviously a few of those. And Amazing stuff. the key there too is reported. I could mm -hmm. only imagine how many more there have been because, you know, all the people that were in the beginning of the call that mentioned that they've seen the, you know, uh, the are you at your desk? I need you to buy some gift cards or give me your cell phone number or the fake resumes and all that other stuff. Probably didn't even report those. Exactly. All right. All team. right. Thanks, everyone. Go get those fish. We'll see you later. Fish, fish.